From her idyllic childhood in the American Midwest to her Oscar-nominated performance in Sunset Boulevard and the social circles of New York and Los Angeles, actress Nancy Olsen Livingston has lived abundantly. And in her memoir, A Front Row Seat, Nancy Olsen Livingston treats readers to an intimate, charming chronicle of her life as an actress, wife, and mother, and her memories of many of the most notable figures and moments of her time. Entertaining and engrossing, a front row seat interweaves Livingston's life with her observations of the artists, celebrities, and luminaries with whom she came in contact. A shout out to the 20th century and a treasure for readers charmed with the golden era of Hollywood. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our very special guest, the one and the only Nancy Olson Livingston. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, you're very welcome. You know, I want to kind of start off from the very beginning of your career. And I, and I wanted to know how important was it for you to actually obtain a college education before setting off to Hollywood to pursue acting? It's interesting. I think that, first of all, I had so much fun in high school and in college with the performing arts. And I was given the opportunity to play so many roles in so many different eras that it gave me a sense of where we are in the world and where we were. And it's, it's interesting uh, when I, I think I realized how important that was many years after I had a career because I, in college, I played all kinds of things from Shakespeare to Tennessee Williams, but, and everything in between. But I also studied science, geography, psychology, so that I had a sense of where these emotions came from and how they were abused or supported. And I had a sense of just the, the world and people living in it that helped me play these various roles. I, I honestly want to say to every, every young person who wants to be an actor or an actress, please get as much education and as much exposure to the arts as you possibly can. That is some very wise advice. And, you know, it, it kind of reminds me of having conversations with today's generation. Sometimes you can't really hold a conversation with them because they don't read. I mean, you were a reader and a studier. I'm always a reader and a studier. And even if we're learning subjects that we're never going to have a career in, at least we know what's going on around us. But I found it interesting, Nancy, that in your book about the education and how that actually truly helps the actor or the actress when they are either auditioning for a part or if they get the part, they can pull from those things that they have learned and have read. And I, I think it's very wise uh, advice that you have given. It's, it's true. Um, you know, speak, speaking of what we all, of course, want, everybody wants to talk about is Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> and the fact that I was a doctor's daughter from the Midwest, I was going to UCLA, I was a student when they signed me to Paramount. Uh, Billy Wilder had a character in Sunset Boulevard, Betty Schaefer. Betty Schaefer was an aspiring writer. So he wanted somebody who was not only a beautiful starlet on the lot, <laughs> But he wanted someone that sounded like they might be an aspiring writer. It's how I spoke, how I used the language. And it's interesting that I, I certainly knew who Billy Wilder was. And I would visit the set or the, uh, the studio whenever I could. When I had a class off or an afternoon off, I would go and I would observe and kind of rotate around the lot and always ended up with a commissary for lunch. 
I wanted to sit next to the writer's table because their laughter just was incredible. They all told jokes and I tried to get to listen to them. Anyway, Billy Wilder started following me on these little journeys and especially on the way to the commissary. And he asked me, what was it like growing up in Wisconsin? And what is it like at UCLA? And I realized that the reason he cast me in that role was because you might believe that I perhaps wanted to be a writer. And I think that's a brilliant way of casting, by the way, to get to know somebody and get to know who they really are. And also, there is an honesty about the character. And I must share something, which I've also written in the book, that my nickname in college was Wholesome Olson. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a feeling of character. And he appreciated that. And he was brilliant at his directing, casting, writing. He was incredible. He truly was. Well, when you played Betty Schaefer, and I understand that uh, part of the story is you actually wore your own wardrobe. Well, that's another thing. Edith Head, who was a, I'm a friend, she was wonderful. And she kept designing things and putting clothes together, saying this is what she should wear in this scene, et cetera, et cetera. And Billy would say, I like what she wore yesterday when she visited the set. <laughs> now, I did not have a great wardrobe. You know, I, I came from Milwaukee to UCLA. I didn't know where to shop. I, did, I didn't have time, but I put myself together as best I could. And that's what Billy wanted. So I had to wear my dreary old clothes. Well, how much of Betty Schaefer was actually Nancy Olson? There was a part of Betty Schaefer, which by the way, there's an oddness to it because it doesn't fit quite with Betty Schaefer, but Jeff, Betty Schaefer, there's this, the, you know, the scene that is constantly, uh, talked about is the back the back lot where bill uh, billy uh, bill holden and i take the walk from at night and i share with him the fact that my father was a grip at the studio and that my mother was a seamstress and that i had this burning ambition to be you know to be a part of it and that was audrey wilder that was his wife or about to be his wife. And that's her background. So it, it was interesting. Also, by the way, in that scene, I say that I wanted to be an actress and first, and that I had my nose. They, they did a test and they said, we don't like your nose. And they so I said, well, I had my nose fixed. And he looks at it. Bill Holden does, and he says, nice job. And I received letters for years. Who fixed your nose? Oh, oh, oh my goodness. Nobody fixed my nose. My nose was my nose. <laughs> but isn't but, that great, though? Because you played the part with such realism that even those that watch the movie, and we know the movie is a movie. It's not a true story. It's a movie. You're playing a character. But that really shows me that when people pay attention, they become a part of the movie. They become part of that story. But then they start believing the things that are in the movie. And yes. I, think that, I think that, in a way, that's a, all those letters, that's a great compliment. But also, I received a postcard like five or six years ago, and I'm very old, as you know. Uh, and it said, you still smell 
like freshly laundered linen handkerchiefs. I said, what? <laughs> it's the line that Bill says, what, after nice job, the nose, he leans over and he says, you smell like freshly lin laundered linen handkerchiefs, which again, describes the wholesome Olson. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, what was it like to be nominated for an Oscar for Sunset Boulevard? Uh, it, it was an amazing uh, honor. I knew that I was not going to win when I looked at the other nominees, but just to have the nomination was a gift. And uh, my life was so busy at that time. I was married to Alan J. Lerner, Lerner and Lowe, and I lived in New York and I was back and forth to Hollywood. And by the way, I decided on that giant, huge room that we filmed in, that was the walls were three feet deep. The door, when it stopped, when it closed, there was, it sealed the rest of the world away from you. And you lived from nine in the morning when we started shooting until six at night with your makeup man, your hairdresser, your wardrobe woman, your assistant director. You had an hour off for lunch and you waited for your turn. And then you filmed, which was kind of interesting. But I sat there and thought, I feel cut off. I'm a prisoner here. I, where, what's happening in the rest of the world? I worked at that time six days a week. So I had Sunday off. And my, my friends at UCLA were treating me a little differently because I was quote unquote, a, for, you know, an emerging movie star. Um, and I didn't have time to be with people and share with people. So I made up my mind then. And I also, by the way, looked at all the other uh, wonderful stars, the women stars of that time. Who was happily married? Who had a lasting relationship like my mother and father? I decided I did not want to be a movie star. Wow. But I could not stop once. I mean, I, I, I told Paramount I did Sunset. And then I did a movie with Bing Crosby, who I was much too young for. And I then did a, two more pictures with Bill Holden, one of the Union Station, which is kind of remembered. And I, I said to, and none of them had been released, including Sunset. And I said, uh, I think I don't want to, to be here anymore. I'm going to move to New York with my new husband and have a new life. They cut off my salary. It didn't matter. Um, it wasn't that much. And I, by the way, I never saw it, my salary because when I was under 21, when I was signed, it was put into a fund by my parents. My allowance was the same. I drove the same car. I please. Um, and I said, goodbye. And then when I married in 1950, in the fall, I, I marry in March of 50, and I'm turning 22. And in the fall, Sunset's released. And the reviews, you know, this is the greatest film ever made. This is an amazing historic moment in filmmaking. It went on and, and, and Betty Schaefer, will never be forgotten. And my phone started ringing. Paramount, my agent, 
it, it was almost impossible to stop it. So actually what happened is that, that Alan, he had, he wrote Paint Your Wagon. That's the first thing he wrote when he was married to me. Uh, and then he did, a, he was going to Hollywood to do a picture called Royal Wedding. And he said, Nancy, they want you to do another picture at Warner Brothers with Bill Holden. Why don't you do it? I'm going to, we, I have to go anyway. So we rented a house and then I became pregnant and started Force of Arms, which was a nightmare. Oh. Anyway, <laughs> that brings you up to date up to that point. <laughs> well, it, you know, it's amazing because, you know, to, in, in today's time, many actors and actresses, if they've shot a film and it hasn't been released yet, most people don't walk away from a possible Hollywood career. But then here you are getting the accolades for Sunset Boulevard, and it, it pulled you back in. Uh, to a certain extent, not really. Not really. I, I wanted to be back in New York and Alan was starting, uh, well, it was a long period of, he was doing all kinds of things that were not working out. And we took a townhouse, we lived in the country in Rockland County and it, it was magical, it was wonderful. And Fritz Lowe, Frederick Lowe, uh, was there all the time working with Alan in the studio across the road. And I had a lot of help. And now I had a baby girl and uh, I did not want to go to Hollywood, please. Um, <laughs> anyway, we, I remember we took a, a townhouse in New York for fall season. And by now I had two little girls. And Alan, I've written about had not written for a long, he tried with other writers. He left Fritz, he left Fritz many times. And Fritz always said, I will never forgive him and never come back. But Alan, one morning, sat on his bed, on the edge of the bed and started to weep. And I went over from my side of the bed to put my arms around him and he said, Oscar and Dick Rogers and Hammerstein were working on Shaw's Pygmalion. They have given up, they've worked a year and they said no one will ever be able to make Pygmalion into a musical. And he said, I know what they're missing. And there's only one writer that can do it with me. And that's Frederick Lowe and he won't talk to me. And I said, Alan, don't you know that he is sitting by his phone waiting for your phone call? And he said, that's nonsense. And I went and dialed Fritz and said, Fritz, it's Nancy. Nonce, he said, call me nonce. How are you? How are the children? I said, Fritz, Alan has an idea. And you're the only person in the world who can possibly work on this project. We're going to the country tomorrow. Can you join us for lunch? And he said, what time? And he came the next day for lunch. We got rid of the townhouse in New York. Fritz said by, by five o'clock, he'd rented the house at the top of the orchard, the little house called his mistress and said, come and join me. And for a year, I sat there and watched them write My Fair Lady. Well, that's my next question, because I know that My Fair Lady was written, of course, by your first husband, Alan J. Lerner, and he wrote the book and the screenplay, as well as, as, well as the lyrics for the musical. Now, well, you after started out by the writing the book and it, uh, you know, adapting the book of, of Shaw for the theater and then took that and adapted again for the motion pictures. Well, then after you read it, you know, and in your book, uh, 
Did you feel that My Fair Lady was going to be a hit? Oh, yes. I heard, I was the first person to hear every song. And it was, they were on such a high, such a roll of creativity. I mean, it was exciting. It really was. You couldn't possibly. Well, as a matter of fact, I did do a movie in the middle of that because by this time we were now in New York City. We went back to New York and bought an apartment and there was a major studio right below us, which we had a little stairway that went down and there was a, a, another huge piano that Fritz worked on with him every day. And they were in the middle of it and I, and I got a call saying, will you do this role in Battle Cry at Warner Brothers opposite Aldo Ray? And you only could, you only have to work for three weeks because it was a, various stories with different people. And they said, we're gonna condense your story and have you work just with your role. And I said, well, yes, I'll do it. So I disappeared for three weeks, came back, and then watch them finish Fair Lady and take it to New Haven for the opening and then ultimately Broadway. You know, it, I, one of the most profound things that I found in your book, A Front Row Seat, was that the way you explained the difference between Broadway and Hollywood. And then you said a great work of art reveals the truth. How so? Well, it's interesting. I said that about Sunset Boulevard. And Sunset Boulevard, that was the power. That's what keeps it contemporary. contemporary. People, because it's old clothes, old cars, and yet, it still tells the truth about something. Therefore, it is as powerful today as it was then. It's fascinating to me. And what it, what it displayed was, or what it told you, or you learned from it, is that making motion pictures and creating movie stars was to make money and movie stars were a commodity. And they actually made you more beautiful than you really were, more sexy, more desirable, more everything than you actually were. And people began to believe their own publicity. Very dangerous, Very. especially in the case of, of Marilyn Monroe, who was truly abused in that regard. And you know something? I knew you were going to ask me about this. Mm -hmm. And can I read just one small paragraph? Please, yes. It says, what distinguishes an attempt to create a work of art from the actual creation of a true work of art that everyone understands, but that everyone understands. What distinguishes that? Everything that has been written, painted, or composed was to share an understanding of a unique view of life, to interpret and explore it to explore it, to force it, force us to face it, and perhaps ultimately to embrace it. In other words, a great work of art reveals the truth. Beautifully said, beautifully said. And your, your book is so, it, like I said in the beginning, it's entertaining, you get engrossed uh, with the stories, but your book just pulls us in. And, you know, and I love the fact that there's still so many people out there 
that love the golden era of Hollywood. I know. And, 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 and in a way, I want to see that kept alive because things back in the day, uh, and sometimes I even think uh, Martin Scorsese, he is the type where he still wants to film with real film, not the digital way, um, not CGI, and even and and I think and I believe that even Quentin Tarantino is the same way. Film is an art, and you're trying to create moving art. And with your book, um, from film for an actor or actress, with film versus Broadway. Which one really tests the actor? Both. Because in film, it's the camera that tells half the story. You don't go to a bookstore and buy a movie script, but you buy a great piece of theater, a Shakespeare, a Moliere, a Tennessee Williams. It's literature and it is from, it's through a, there's this proscenium, which is over there. Now in Sunset Boulevard, I mean, down there, thousand, you know, 50 miles away, that's, you can have an actor share of something that's obviously hurting and he doesn't have to tell you how it hurts. He, the camera can move in and take a close-up of one tear going down your cheek and it tells the whole story. And Billy Wilder understood that. He has a, every page there's a description of what the camera is showing you. It's so fascinating. You have Bill Holden looking out of the window of the garage when he, when he decides to stay. And he, and he peers out of his window to an empty pool with rats at the bottom, eating leaves and rotten things. All of that was described in the script. So you write, right away, you know that this is a, a place that is dismal and, and forgotten. Now what about broad? Yeah, what about Broadway? If, Broadway? if you're on the stage of Broadway, how do you engage you have, the audience? You have to then tell the story from the actor and from the writing of what they're feeling, what they've just experienced. As a matter of fact, Billy Wilder, when when Andrew Lloyd Webber did a music, did his own musical, theater musical, Billy said it was my movie in a permanent long shot. There you have it. I read that, I read that. And are you amazed the differences between Hollywood during the golden era where an actor or an actress was signed to a five or seven picture deal? And I presume that it was just one salary for the whole lot versus now where an actor can get paid 10 to 20 million for one picture. Is it the actor holding the studio ransom or is it the other way around? The, the golden age of Hollywood is gone. I, it, motion pictures don't interest me that much anymore. In, in my time, the studio owned the writers. For instance, uh, my brother-in-law, Jay Livingston, Livingston and Evans, they worked at Paramount under a salary. And if Bing Crosby needed a song about Christmas, they would hire Jay and Ray Evans, his partner, to write a song. And it would be, uh, what's the famous one about Christmas? Anyway, <laughs> um, K Sera Sera is another one that they've written. They had three or four Academy Awards. And in other words, they were, the studio said, we own the writers, we own the musicians, the, the, the people who are writing the score, the composers. We own the people who are writing the songs. 
we won the directors and our at, the, at Paramount there was uh, Billy Wilder as William Wilder as well as Billy Wilder. There was um, oh God, what's his name? Who did all those horrible films with big <laughs> major Cecil B. DeMille? Oh, and there was uh, Hal Wallace. There were major producers who were all under the auspices and had a salary from Paramount. So that, that this really worked because Billy Wilder, Bill, Billy, Bill Holden was already under contract. So he said, I'm going to put, I'm going to use Bill Holden. I'm going to use that young girl, Nancy Olson, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so, Things were more creative. They were more thoughtful. Today, you're paid, you know, 20 million because your name is going to make the picture make money. And then all the other pieces fall apart as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And I mean, the, the quality of movie making today, it, this, I'll say the quality of the stories, let's just say they just simply suck, you know. Because back in your day, that was true storytelling. And, and even back then, even with directors, um, they were still learning. They were still learning the, the camera shots. It, you know, besides filming inside of a studio, if they were shooting a Western. I mean, just the, the whole process. And now everybody wants to make movies uh, with a big budget, but they always take the cheap way out in actually creating them. But yes. we could talk forever about that. But I understand that you starred in five Disney films. So what led you to your working relationship with Walt Disney? Well, I was in Mallorca finishing a, a, a summer vacation. And or it was the begin, beginning of August. And I was going to pick up my two daughters who were with their father and their stepmother and, uh, and then go back to California because I was living in New York, but go, to be with my parents and spend the rest of the summer with the governess and the two children and me at the Oceana. And my parents lived in Brentwood Park and we could have the rest of the summer together. And I got a phone call that said, Walt Disney. Walt Disney is on the phone, wants to talk. Well, I thought this is a joke. And he said, Nancy, this is Walt Disney. He said, we are making a picture called Pollyanna. And he said, uh, we're spending much more money. We have spent the money on our, our uh, car you know, the cartoon, not the cartoons, but the oh, I got you. <laughs> but, but he said the, the film is we disregard it and we are now concentrating on making our films first rate and he said we have nothing but stars in this picture he said we have this young girl Haley Mills we have Jane Wyman we have Carl Malden we have Adolf Manjou we have Agnes Moorhead. He went on and on that every part in the entire play was somewhat a star. And he said, we want you. And I said, well, when are you starting shooting? He said, it, it, the last week in August. And he said, you'll be about four weeks. And I said, well, I was going to go back to New York with my children to put them back in school. Uh, of the second week in September, but they can go back with the governess and I could finish. This is kind of working out. So I said, I'll do it. And I walked on the Disney lot for the first time. And I experienced something so unusual. It was like, when I went to work to, at Warner Brothers and Paramount and briefly at MGM, these were big cities. This was a small town. And that was the atmosphere. 
it was clean. It was, everybody said, hi, Nancy. Hi, Walt. Everybody called Walt to speak by his first name. The Grips. Hi, Walt. It was a different culture. And I enjoyed doing it. I finished the film. I went back to New York, forgot about it. Then I got a call in the spring saying, we're doing something called The Absent-Minded Professor. We are very proud of this script. Fred McMurray is going to play the lead. We'd like you to play opposite him. And we'll send you the script and you can tell us what you think. They sent me the script and I was kind of enchanted with it. I thought it was, if they could pull it off visually with anti-gravity, <laughs> I thought, this will be interesting to do. And again, it was the summer. I was bringing the children to California and stay at the Oceana. <laughs> and uh, so I did it and went back to New York. And I, I by the way, it's kind of a minor classic. The absent mind. You should, if you ever, have you seen oh, it? Oh, I've seen it. I saw it when I was a kid. Oh, didn't you love it? I loved it. I, you know, back then, I loved all the Disney films. And, and, and not just the cartoons. I love the actual movies that Walt made. Yes. Oh. They were magical. A, he was a genius. Oh, absolutely. He truly was a genius. I mean, his Pinocchio. And as I, it, I, Snow White was one of the first films I ever saw when I was a little girl. And I have never forgotten it. When Snow White dances with the, 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 uh, the little. Yeah, men, the seven dwarfs. The seven dwarfs. It is so enchanting and so beautiful and drawn so beautifully. Well, you know what, Nancy? The thing that, even to this day, when I look back and, and I watch Snow White, I watch Cinderella, um, my gosh, so many others that, that he did on the cartoon, on the cartoon, the animated side. And I think of the time when they were actually created and you look at them still today and they are the truest sense of cinematic art. Because even today, if an animation is done, it doesn't have that magic. It doesn't have that flow, that, that, that smoothness, that here's, here are these animators and these writers and flipping pages and gels trying to get the characters to come to life. And then when it is put on film, even I back know. in that time, it still, it still, it puts me in awe of such what Walt Disney did and created in the talent and his imagination. He was amazing. Truly. Truly. And you, 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 if you ever have an opportunity, if you go to San Francisco, visit the museum because it talks about the beginning when he was beginning to experiment with Mickey Mouse and some of the earliest drawings and what his, uh, where his imagination and artistry took him to. What's also interesting about Walt Disney is that he was, he was from the Midwest. There was something very Midwestern about him. And there was a limited sense of the world in his, he was a Republican a staunch Republican. <laughs> and that bothered me. Most artists, it's interesting that I have known, and I've known many of them, were Democrats. Yeah, and they were. Be Democrats, they, and, and they'd be Democrats today, but not Walt Disney. Interesting. Very interesting. Now, the other thing that I want to ask you is because you, your second husband, 
Alan Livingston, and what a storied career he had as president of Capitol Records, signing the Beatles, signing the Beach Boys, and I happen to be friends with the manager of the Beach Boys, and I found it so fascinating. My gosh, a whole book could just be written on uh, Alan's career and the and the people he made superstars. You know, it's so funny because I was talking to my daughter, and she loves the golden era of Hollywood, and, and she loves music history way back in the day. And and so we, we got into a discussion about your husband, Alan Livingston. And I said, you know, reading her book, Alan had the eye, he had the ear. He could see things that other people didn't see. He took chances on people that people would disregard, like Frank Sinatra. And we looked at that and compared it to today where you have people like Simon Cowell, for example. But Alan had something that even today, no one has. He had the ability, the skill, the eye, the ear to find these people. And, and, and when I read in your book that he literally saw Nat King Cole as a soloist, I was like, oh, wow. That, that is just the most amazing thing ever. And uh, what, what was it like having Alan Livingston as your husband? Well, speaking of Nat King Cole, uh, Alan was had nothing to. He was uh, in. He began doing artists and repertoire, but he was not producing the Cole the, the trio. And Nat played the piano, and he he occasionally sang various phrases. And Alan heard immediately that he was a he could sing, and he would could be a real star. And so he went to Nat, and went to the producer, and Nat said, "No, that's impossible. I, you're, you're crazy." So Alan said, "Look, let me find a song for you, and just once try it." And so he found Nature Boy. And Nat did not care for Nature Boy. So he turned, he, the, on the other side of the record, he did The Greatest of Them All, which was about God. And that was what he thought would be the hit. Everybody turned the record around and listened to Nature Boy. And from that moment on, he was one of the great single stars of Capitol Records. He really and was, and was still one of the greatest voices in music. And you know, it, in those, at that time, the, the black community, they, you, they were called race records. And that they, uh, the, the black companies would produce them, but Nat was different. And he would write, he would sing love songs that were played in the background of white couples as part of their romance, which was highly unusual, but was happening. Yeah, you know, I even, uh, uh, not too long ago, we actually filmed, um, we, we did our own um, Elvis week and, and interviewed a lot of people who personally, literally personally knew Elvis. And it was amazing. The stories that we would hear about where all of the songs that Elvis loved came from that era of race records. And, right. and a lot of other stars were birthed from that and uh, yeah. little Richard and BB King. And, and, and it's amazing. And it's amazing that you bring that up because, you know, there's a history there and there's a great history there that a lot of people need to realize that during that time, it was the white people buying all the records. I, yes, indeed. But speaking of Alan Livingston. Yes. Alan had a focus of listening and sensing where it should be and go and who should do it. And by the way, in the meantime, a lot of people were stabbing him in the back. So because 
he was so focused and so successful. And I learned that in the world, people resent that. They want to stop you, Mm -hmm. which saddens me tremendously. Anyway, one day was shortly after we were married. uh, Alan never came home for lunch. But he called me and he said, Nancy, I want to come home for lunch today. And I thought, what? So he came home and he's, he wanted to play something for me. And so we had, we had lunch and then he said, okay, I want you to listen to this. And he said, Nancy, in the thirties, there were the big bands. In the middle of the forties, Frank Sinatra took off and the, what he was singing and how he was singing took off. He said the fifties, Elvis Presley dominated the business. He said, this is the next step. And I listened to, I want to hold your hand. I want to hold your hand. And I said, Alan, that's the worst thing I ever heard. (laughs) How could I have done that? And poor Alan went back to the Capitol Records, went to his office. He called Brian Epstein, the manager, and said, we're going we're gonna to do it. We're going to sign him. And Brian Epstein said, you got to spend $40,000 right off the bat, which sounds like nothing today. It's a lot then. Alan said, we will. And of course, look what happened. I know it was funny because when I finished reading your book, um, because I, I own all the Beatle albums. I actually went back from album number one and literally started listening to the songs again. And I was like, wow, he signed the Beatles. Now, I want to ask you, why did Alan take a chance on Frank Sinatra? Columbia let him go. They would not re-sign him. They made a statement saying his career is over. He could not get a club date. He was drinking too much. He got had this huge affair with Ava Gardner and she left him and he was bereft. And Alan got a phone call one day from uh, one of the agents in, and said, Alan, would you be interested in signing Frank Sinatra? And Alan said, right away, I would. He said, you would? Alan said, he is, he needs a new repertoire and he needs a new conductor arranger. He said, I will sign him to a seven year standard contract and let's see what we can do. He met with Frank. And he said, Frank, I want to put you with Nelson Riddle. You two belong together and can make magic. Frank said, I only work with Axel Stordahl, period. And Alan said, typical Alan Livingston. He said, okay, let's put out a few records and see how they do. Nothing happened. And then a song, you know, the publishers would come to people like Alan and say, this is a new song and that we're publishing it. And Alan listened to Young at Heart. And he knew right away this was for, for Frank and it was for Nelson Riddle. So what he did was he called Nelson and said, could you arrange this? He said, I have the studio on Sunday afternoon, we have to, and he called Frank and he said, just this once, would you please work with Nelson on this song? Everybody's going to do it. It'll go out. It'll be a huge hit. We have to be first. And this was interesting too about Frank. He didn't listen to the music first. He read the lyric first. And then listen to the music or Bing Crosby listened to the music first. What could it do for his voice? Frank wanted to sing the lyric. 
So he said, okay, I'll work with Nelson Riddle just this once. And you know, to this day, I could see my handsome husband sitting in the control room with his arms folded, smiling while he is listening to this record of Nelson's arrangement and Frank singing Young at Heart. It was the biggest hit in 40 years. And Frank, I think, probably never worked with, with the other arranger conductor ever again. <laughs> Well, I, you know, as you're telling that story, I have to give credit to Alan Livingston because to sign Frank Sinatra when nobody else wanted him, if it wasn't for Alan Livingston, Frank Sinatra would have never been called the chairman of the board. That's Plain true. and simple. And... and when Alan mentioned to his to the group about all the new material that would come out within the next three months, he said, and we've just signed Frank Sinatra, and there was this reaction in the audience. Oh. And Alan said, just a minute. He is the most gifted interpreter of the American song in this century. I Give us time. It. And all of a sudden, he took off. And I can't think of anybody to this day that has ever matched that. I mean, no. Frank Sinatra is Frank Sinatra. I mean, sure, you know, there was the Rat Pack. There was Dean Martin and the rest of them. But it's Sinatra. I mean, he is still the... Perf well... He was the performer, the entertainer, the ultimate crooner. Nobody will ever beat Sinatra. But I have to ask you, Nancy, because you've got to give me the full lowdown and the truth about this infamous garden party. Oh. Well, Alan's son had hemophilia, Peter. And it is probably the most awful disease for a young boy to have and deal with. And the Hemophiliac Society was after us every minute to, to create an event to raise money for the Hemophiliac Society. There were families that were very poor that couldn't afford the transfusions and the, and the medical help. So it was my first experience in doing something in the area of charity and creating something for it. And I said, well, of course, the most obvious thing would be to do a Beatles party, but forget it. I mean, can you imagine? So I said, well, what about doing a party around at two o'clock in the afternoon? We, and we do it in my mother's, they, she still has, and my brother still lives there, the house in Brentwood Park, which is an acre there's no pool, but the most beautiful garden with beautiful trees. And so I asked my mother if she could possibly do a party in the afternoon for, with the Beatles, the four of them. And uh, she said, well, yes, we'll put them under the Deodora tree. We'll get four stools. She had it all figured out. And I, we could have a, a one long table with lemonade and cookies and a chance to go through a receiving line and meet the Beatles. And the invitation would be personal from Alan and Nancy Livingston and would be our friends. Now, uh, I forget his name. One of our friends was a leading publicist and had a daughter and i knew his wife very well isn't that awful what i Linda? no that's okay because i'm trying to figure out how in the world you kept kept all of the the fans anyway, away 
I, we, we invited them and, um, and they, he called Alan and said, look, can I invite some of my clients? And Alan said, send me their names, send me their addresses, and we will send a personal invitation to them. And we charged, you know, $100 for adults, $25 for children, and it would all go to the hemophiliac society. And guess what? The Beatles said yes. Because they cared for Alan. They understood who he was. And they trusted him. And they knew that, it, that they would be protected. It would be in the afternoon. And they said yes, they would do it. Imagine. And Brian Epstein, he sent $10,000 to the Hemophiliac Society. Anyway, it's a long story. You have to, uh, I, getting a, a limousine was impossible because they said, oh, we're going to take the Beatles somewhere, forget it. Our car will be demolished. We'll, we will, it, Alan said, I will pay for it. They said, no, we won't have the use of the car while it's being fixed. He said, I'll pay for that as well. So he got the limousine, the Beatles arrived, the guests arrived, Nick Dunn's daughter had a, a, a picture was taken of each child going through and they were shown in the lobby of, the, of Capitol Records and the families could go and order them of their children going through the line. Wow. And there's a picture of the, Nick Dunn's little girl curtsying in front of John or Paul, maybe, whichever, curtsy. And Nick had that photograph in his living room framed hugely on the wall until the day he died. Well, did you have a favorite Beatle? Paul became a friend of ours and where we had, we could have dinner with him alone occasionally. Uh, John was difficult. We were saddened when he was murdered, but uh, he was he was a strange but very gifted writer, lyric writer. And um, Ringo was fun and easy and uh, very accessible. And George was quiet and yeah, that, shy. Yeah, you, I think you explained them perfectly. And Nancy, my goodness, you have a million stories. You've lived, like I said at the very beginning in my intro, an abundant life. You married two Allens. Um, both geniuses in their own right. And ladies and gentlemen, you, you have to get the book, a front row seat. And see, you can see all my tabs here from reading and yeah. researching here, but it's Nancy Olson Livingston, a front row seat. You're going to love, there, there is more in this book. And, you know, many of my friends who are watching your, your filmmakers, your directors, your producers, and and for all of you that I know who work in the music industry, being music producers, your musicians, your singer songwriters, you've got to get Nancy's book. You want to read the history. You want to understand where your gifts and passions really kind of came from because the road was created and here we are now. And Nancy, what a beautiful book, a beautiful I, I story, beautiful all, life. Yes. Thank you, thank you. But I have to remind the readers that I, I reveal a story about Jack Kennedy. And I was with him the night he was inaugurated at Joe Alsop's house. That in itself was an amazing experience. Alan the Learner and I were invited to Jackie and Jack's wedding, but we didn't go because I just had my second child. And it was too much trouble to go to Boston. And I didn't save the invitation. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Wow. Anyway, that in it's just that story and how Jack 
was the night he was made president is interesting. Yeah, and again, um, ladies and gentlemen, you the you can go to Amazon.com to buy Nancy's book. Um, it is history. It is film history. It is music history. It is her life story. But she tells the stories of others, and every single story you will absolutely enjoy. And Nancy, this has been an absolute honor for me. Oh, thank you. And I've enjoyed it too. Well, I am so glad. And uh, anything that you would like to uh, leave my viewers with, or maybe those that are aspiring actors, actresses, and maybe musicians? Oh, if you are an artist, keep going. Do what you do best. Enjoy it. And be generous about it. There you go, ladies and gentlemen, wise words. So if you are a creative type, take that to heart. And remember, always be generous with your gift. Nancy, I want to thank you for being on my show. And ladies and gentlemen, you have to stick around because I will be right back with more. Thank you.